Chapter 15, The Valley of God Poverty Joseph had borne before, tarring and beating he had turned to advantage, but to be exiled by his own disciples and driven from the temple in which he had been intoxicated with visions and glory killed much of his tenderness and naive exuberance. In flight from Kirtland, Joseph reflected sorrowfully that at last he had the measure of his men's devotion, and it went no deeper than their pockets. But there was a more fundamental cause of the hostility that he had banished into the wilderness. Distrust of clergymen who stepped outside their profession was one of the most deeply rooted mores of the Republic. Tocqueville had marveled at the pride that Americans took in their uncompromising separation of church and state, and had noted that most ministers made it a point of honor to abstain from politics. The constitutions of almost every state in the Mississippi Valley expressly interdicted clergymen from taking any office or profit or trust as a gift of the people. From the inauguration of the United Order to the collapse of the Kirtland Safety Society Bank, Joseph had been groping for control of the temporal as well as the spiritual life of his people. He had even dabbled hesitantly in politics by introducing a slate of Mormon candidates in the local Kirtland election of 1835 a move that roused a storm in the Painesville Telegraph. Cowdery accused him of attempting to set up a kind of petty government, controlled and dictated by ecclesiastical influence in the midst of this national and state government. But to Joseph, such a reproach was incomprehensible. Cowdery had seen visions that were more real to him than meat and drink, and Joseph could not understand why a man who had seen the glory of Jehovah in the Kirtland Temple should afterwards scorn a revelation because it dealt with the cost of a city lot instead of a celestial crown. Kirtland's collapse might have shocked him into awareness of the social pressure he was opposing, but Joseph, like all true adventurers, could not see himself as part of the world. He was always astride it. The Kirtland debacle had become a persecution symbol which heightened rather than humbled his sense of destiny. So swift a downfall could be explained only in terms of enemy conspiracy and the machinations of the devil. Hence, there was no self-searching and but few regrets. By the time he covered his 800 miles to Upper Missouri, much of his old buoyancy had returned, and his reception in Far West banished all traces of his gloom. The whole town turned out to meet him, singing and cheering. His oldest converts, who had been in Missouri since 1831, looked upon his flight from Kirtland as an answer to prayer. The bank failure, they said, was simply God's device for bringing the prophet to Zion to stay. It had been a net to cull the saints out from that region to the blessed and consecrated land. Joseph and his family lived at the home of George W. Harris, whose attractive wife, Lucinda, was famous as the widow of the great anti-Masonic martyr, William Morgan. At this home, two months after her arrival, Emma bore another son. When the child lived through the first dreaded days of weakness and grew and fattened in Missouri sunshine, the whole church looked upon it as an omen of good fortune. Joseph now had three sons, Joseph, Frederick, and Alexander Hale. Far West had enjoyed an extraordinary growth. Without goods and almost without money, the exiles in a single year had built a city out of naked energy and millennial hope. There were 1,500 saints in the New Mormon County. Far West had been laid out on the plan of Joseph's ideal city, divided neatly into squares separated by streets wide enough for half a dozen wagons to pass abreast. A section of the prairie had been sold at auction for $5,000, the proceeds going into a fund for building schools, and one schoolhouse had already been erected. Not long before Joseph's arrival, the whole male population of the county had turned out to excavate the cavernous basement for a new temple. In far west, Joseph could see at first hand the might of his priesthood. There were no scattered, lonely cabins where every man was jealous of his five-mile privacy. This was a kind of frontier socialism, energized by millennial zeal and oiled by the spirit of the brotherhood of man. It had speeded up tenfold the usual painful process of individual adjustment to new land. Quickly, the prophet transferred all his enthusiasm to the new country and began to speak of the Kirtland era with contempt as seven long years of servitude, persecution, and affliction in the hands of our enemies. Meanwhile, the good news came from Kirtland that many dissenting saints, disgusted by the rantings of the apostates in the temple, had rejoined the faithful and were planning to come to Zion. Joseph going had left a void that they had found intolerable. With each passing week, they remembered less of their prophet's financial ineptitude and more of his genial warmth and his magnetic presence in the pulpit. Six hundred saints finally pulled their resources and started for Zion in the longest wagon train that Kirtland had ever seen. The Gentiles shook their heads in wonder. 
It was marvelous, wrote Christopher Crary, to see with what tenacity they held to their faith in the prophet when they knew they had been robbed, abused, and insulted. The departure of this group reduced Kirtland to the sleepy village it had been when Joseph arrived in 1831. Nearby Cleveland eventually became a vast metropolis, its suburbs reaching out across the hills almost to the temple doors. The Mormon city, bereft of the virile spirit of its leader, withered into a museum piece. Far West has surrounded, was surrounded by thousands of unplowed acres stretching west, north, and east. With characteristic energy, Joseph set about surveying and laying claim to enormous tracts of territory. Although the Missouri legislature had hoped that the Mormons would be content with Caldwell County, which had been set off specifically for them, they quickly spread into Davies, Carroll, and Ray counties as well, where scattered handfuls of old settlers watched them with suspicion. Shortly after his arrival, Joseph rode up the Grand River to Lyman White's Ferry to explore land on the north bank in Davies County. On a high bluff overlooking the river, someone in the party discovered the ruins of what seemed to be an altar and excitedly led the prophet to it. After examining it, Joseph stood silent, his eyes sweeping over the prairie that rolled away beneath him. In every season, the prairie was a garden, its colors changing as the wild flowers bloomed and died. Now it was spring, and the whole landscape glowed with the color of peach blow. The glory of the scene made Joseph heady as with new wine. This is the valley of God in which Adam blessed his children, he said. And upon this very altar, Adam himself offered up sacrifices to Jehovah. This place is Tower Hill, and it, at its feet we will lay out a city which shall be called Adam on thy Amen. Here Adam, the Ancient of Days, shall come to visit his people. He shall sit on a throne of fiery flame, as predicted by Daniel the prophet, with thousand thousands ministering unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand standing before him. The saints had long believed that independence in Jackson County was the original site of the Garden of Eden. Now Joseph told them that Adam on Diamon was the land where Adam dwelt after his expulsion from Eden, and that far west was probably the exact spot where Cain killed Abel. Joseph was quick to lay his fingers upon the pulse of his new country. Carefully he probed the sentiments of his nearest non-Mormons, listened for signs of disunity among his own people, and studied the political alignments dividing the state. Never before had he lived in a place where force was so triumphant and moral values at such a discount. Slowly something of the ruthlessness and cynicism of the frontier began to seep into his own thinking, and in fact to infect his whole people. Here, for the first time, the Mormons were living in relative isolation with what seemed unlimited room for expansion. Certain that the last days were approaching, converts were immigrating at a rate that astounded even Joseph, and from the English mission came word of phenomenal conversions among the poverty-ridden English workers. With such dynamic forces at his fingertips, it is small wonder that the prophet began to dream of empire. Like all the other border states, Missouri was pathologically sensitive on the slavery issue. Lynching was the common fate of colored criminals, and white men had to be threatened with death by flogging for teaching Negroes to read. Three years before Joseph's arrival, a lynching party had seized a Negro murderer and burned him to death. When the leaders were brought to trial, the judge, whose name fittingly enough was Lawless, defined the duty of the jury in the following remarkable statement. If the destruction of the murderer was not the act of numerable and ascertainable malefactors, but of congregated thousands, seized upon by, impelled by that mysterious metaphysical and almost electric frenzy which in all ages and nations has hurried on the infuriated multitude to deeds of death and destruction, then, I say, act not at all in the matter. The case transcends your jurisdiction. It is beyond the reach of human law. Only one Missouri editor, Elijah Lovejoy, had the courage to protest this judicial sanction of mob rule, and for his indignant editorials in the St. Louis Observer, he was hounded out of the state. Crossing the Mississippi into Illinois, he boldly founded a newspaper advocating freedom for the slaves. Late in 1837, a mob riddled him with bullets, and overnight abolitionism brought, into, brought about a national emergency. Lovejoy's martyrdom Joseph Smith did not savor. He knew all the details firsthand, having crossed the Mississippi not far north of Alton but two months after the murder. He realized now that despite his own cautious justification of slavery, the Missourians could not forget the fact that the majority of his fast-growing colony were Yankees who abominated it. The whole Lovejoy tragedy made it clear that non-slaveholders in Missouri could expect no justice in the courts. Against the mob, of, against the mob spirit, which was bound eventually to be kindled against his people, there seemed but one defense, an armed force. From the bottom of his heart, Joseph hated violence, but his people were demanding something more than meekness and compromise, 
It was common gossip among the old settlers that the Mormons would never fight, and Joseph came to realize that in a country where a man's gun spoke faster than his wits, to be known as a pacifist was to invite plundering. For the first time he had begun to judge his men with an eye to their physical courage and quickness with a gun. He made Lyman White, whose foolhardy valor he had hitherto mistrusted, president of the new stake in the tent of Zion at Adam on Diamond, and he listened with interest to Samson Avard, who claimed to know something of soldiering and who had a secret plan for the defense of the saints. Avard, who was cunning, resourceful, and extremely ambitious, suggested the formation of a military body to be organized in companies of tens and fifties, each presided over by a captain. These men were to swear fraternal oaths binding them to everlasting secrecy. In times of danger, they would communicate with one another by secret signs and passwords. They would not only defend the saints against aggression from the old settlers, but also act as a bodyguard for the presidency and as a secret police for ferreting out dissenters. Rigdon was immensely attracted to Evard's scheme. He did not greatly fear trouble with the Missourians, for he lacked Joseph's political acumen, but his hatred of heretics within the church had become an obsession. Many of the faction that had turned against Joseph when the bank failed in Kirtland, including Cowdery and David Whitmer, had filtered in the far west, half forgiving, half mistrustful, but unable to break completely with the prophet they had revered and loved. Most of them blamed Rigdon for all the church's ills, and they found a willing ear among the old-time Missouri Mormons, who had always been jealous of his hold on the prophet. To Rigdon's old dislike of Missouri there was added, therefore, this new and intolerable, intolerable feeling of insecurity. He hoped in Avard's band to set up a force that would stamp out malicious gossip against himself. By mid-June 1838, there was whispered talk in Far West about a secret society variously called the Brother Brothers of Gideon, after the first Captain General Jared Carter, who had a brother named Gideon, the Daughters of Zion, the Sons of Dan, and the Danites. The Prophet and Rigdon were careful not to be associated too intimately with the band, leaving Avar to his own devices. And since he was at heart as rapacious and cruel as the worst border ruffian, those devices were not pretty. John Coral, who attended two early Danite meetings, came away convinced of Avard's villainy. He communicated his shocked protest to Rigdon, only to be advised to stay away from future meetings. A good many other Mormons who became Danites later described Avard's machinery. Their stories of oaths, passwords, and secret signs are fragmentary, but consistent. Footnote. David Whitmer and Don Oliver Cowdery held Rigdon chiefly responsible for the Danites. See Address to All Believers in Christ, page 27, and Defense in a Rehearsal of My Grounds for Separating Myself from the Latter-day Saints. Most of the details of Danite archives come from apostates, but there are occasional allusions in the unpublished diaries and the autobiographies of Danites who never left the church. Among them there is a complete agreement that the Danites were a brotherhood organized for the defense of the saints. See the typewritten transcripts of the biographical sketch of Lumen Andros Shirtliff, page 32, the Journal of Alan J. Stout, page 9, and Diary of Oliver Boardman Huntington, volume 1, page 36. These are on file in the Utah State Historical Society Library. The Mormons who apostatized on the Danite issue left a huge legacy of testimony about the aims and occasional depredations of the society. Orson Hyde, W.W. W. Phelps, and Thomas B. Marsh were among these, but they later returned to the church, and Hyde was even restored to full favor as an apostle. Their statements, therefore, are worth noting, and they fully corroborate the evidence furnished by the others. They were published in full in what is now a very rare document, correspondence, orders, etc., in relation to the disturbances with the Mormons and the evidence given before the Honorable Austin A. King, Judge of the Fifth Judicial Circuit of the State of Missouri at the Courthouse in Richmond, in a criminal court of inquiry begun November 12, 1838 on the trial of Joseph Smith Jr. and others for high treason and other crimes against the state. In addition to the testimonies of Hyde, Marsh, and Phelps, see the statements of Samson Avard, John Coral, John Clemenson, Reed Peck, and John Sapp, all of whom turned state's evidence. John Whitmer, John Coral, and Reed Peck all wrote histories of this period which included details of the Danite organization. Whitmer's account was never published, has never been published, having been omitted from the history of the church when it was published by the reorganized church in the Journal of History, Volume 1. The complete manuscript is in the church library independence. Coral's brief hist history of the church was published in 1839 and is now very rare. Peck's manuscript, dated 1839, the original of which is now in my possession, was published by L. B. Cake in 1899 under the title Peepstone Joe Exposed. For additional 
intimate details of the Danites, see John D. Lee, Mormonism Unveiled. Footnote over. But the most significant account came from the pen of the prophet himself, who described Avard's secret instructions to his captains in part as follows. Know ye not, brethren, that it will soon be your privilege to take your respective companies and go out on a scout on the borders of these settlements, and take to yourselves spoils of the goods of the ungodly Gentiles? For it is written, The riches of the Gentiles shall be consecrated to my people, the house of Israel, and thus you will waste away the Gentiles by robbing and plundering them of their property. And in this way we will build up the kingdom of God and roll forth the little stone that Daniel saw cut out of the mountain without hands, and roll forth until it filled the whole earth. For this is the very way that God destines to build up his kingdom in the last days. If any of us should be recognized, who can harm us? For we will stand by each other and defend one another in all things. I would swear a lie to clear any of you. And if this would not do, I would put them or him under the sand as Moses did the Egyptian. And in this way we will consecrate much unto the Lord. And if one of this Danite society reveals any of these things, I will put him where the dogs cannot bite him. Joseph wrote in his history that he repudiated Avard and had him excommunicated as soon as he discovered these machinations. He stated further that he himself organized a military body made up of companies of tens and fifties which was completely distinct from Avard's. But it is clear that these were more of the prophet's characteristic efforts to write his own history as he wished it had been lived and not as it really happened. For Avard actually was not excommunicated until March 8, 17, 1839, four months after he had turned traitor and left the church. Between June and November 1838, he had ruled the Danites with a free hand and was one of the most powerful men in the church. Joseph, shortly before his death, inadvertently made a confused and damaging admission of his own relationship to the Danite organization. The Danite system never had any existence. It was a term made of use of by some of the brethren in Far West, and grew out of an expression I made use of when the brethren were preparing to defend themselves from the Missouri mob in reference to the stealing of Micaiah's images, Judges chapter 18. If the enemy comes, the Danites will be after them, meaning the brethren in self-defense. Rigdon stated frankly and publicly that the Danite band was organized for mutual protection and against the depredations of Missourians, and denied only that he and the prophet had been members. Although Joseph did not regularly attend the Danite meetings, there is no doubt that Avard had his sanction, for he formally addressed the Danites at least once and pronounced a blessing upon Avard's head. The time has come, he said in his speech, when the Lord has willed for us to take up arms in our own defense. We wish to do nothing unlawful. If the people of the world will but let us alone, we will preach the gospel and live in peace. All we ask is that you place your trust in the presidency, in Brother Sidney, Brother Hiram, and myself. And I will give you a pledge that if we lead you into any difficulty, I will give you my head for a football to be kicked about in Missouri dust. Avard was shrewd enough to make heresy against the presidency the most heinous crime in the church. This won him complete freedom of action and blinded the prophet to the more barbar barbarous implications of his scheming. Avard told his men that they should support the presidency in all their designs, right or wrong. He did not mince words. If I meet one damning and cursing the presidency, I can curse them too. And if he will drink, I will get him a bowl of brandy and after a while take him by the arm and get him on one side in the brush when I will into his guts in a minute and put him under the sod. It was frightening to thoughtful men like Reed Peck and John Coral to see the effect of Missouri upon Sidney Rigdon. Like Joseph, he too was dreaming of empire. But where Joseph planned in terms of stately temples and ordered cities, Rigdon looked to a kingdom of men without sin. And since to Rigdon almost all of the good things in life were evil, he intended to use his power in the kingdom to banish gaiety, good living, and independent thinking. He had always been unstable and fanatical, but no one could challenge his fierce loyalty to the prophet, even though it had found expression chiefly in denunciation of real or imagined foes. Now he was translating his savage invectives into action. From the moment of his arrival in Missouri, he did not rest until he had seen Oliver Cowdery and John and David Whitmer cut off from the church. Their expulsion left him with no rivals of any stature. Of the eleven witnesses to the Book of Mormon, only Joseph's father and brothers were left in the church. Many of the apostles were away on missions, and Brigham Young, the only one capable of challenging Rigdon, had not yet been given a chance to show his strength. Still, Rigdon was not content. The dissenters, though living in ignominy and insulation, isolation, 
had chosen to remain in Far West, and their presence was a thorn in his flesh. They claimed a good deal of property in and about the town, to which the title had been never been clear, and soon threatened to involve the church leaders in a series of lawsuits. At this time, Rigdon and the Prophet were planning to inaugurate a new economic experiment that would integrate the church into a self-sustaining unit capable of withstanding any assault. But until they gained a title to the disputed property, they could not hope to launch the new order without embarrassment. Rigdon was infuriated when Cowdery decided to carry the suits to the Missouri courts, which were almost certain to hand down a decision against the church presidency. In a public speech on June 17, Rigdon poured out his spleen. He, to he took as his text, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall the earth be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. For an hour he harangued against the dissenters, becoming more and more infuriated. If only the county cannot be freed of these men in any other way, he finally shouted. I will assist to trample them down or erect a gallows on the square of Far West and hang them up as they did the gamblers at Vicksburg, and it would be an act at which the angels would smile with approbation. Rigdon's passion struck fire, and angry murmurs spread through the crowd. Joseph rose to advise against lawlessness and stem the mounting ire, but he added a significant warning. I don't want the brethren to act unlawfully, but will tell them one thing. Judas was a traitor, and instead of hanging himself, was hung by Peter. This led John Corll to believe that Rigdon's salt sermon was a signal to the Danites, and he secretly warned the dissenters to flee far west. This, however, they stubbornly refused to do. John Whitmer later testified that he went to the prophet and asked him frankly what he could do to mitigate the feeling roused against him by Rigdon's sermon. The excitement is very high, Joseph agreed coldly, coldly, and I don't know what can be done to allay it, but I will give you a frank opinion. If you will put your property into the hands of the bishop and high council and let it be disposed of according to the laws of the church, perhaps after a little while the church might have confidence in you. I wish to control my own property, Whitmer argued. I don't. I want to be governed by the laws of the land and not the law of the church. Now you wish to pin me down to the law, Joseph replied, and abruptly terminated to the discussion. Soon the dissenters received a long letter written in Rigdon's characteristic bombastic style and laden with his venom. It was signed by 83 leading Mormons, including Hiram Smith and several members of the High Council, and said in part... Whereas the citizens of Caldwell County have borne with the abuse received from you at different times and on different occasions, until it is no longer to be endured, out of the county you shall go, and no power shall save you, and you shall have three days after you receive this communication, including twenty-four hours in each day, for you to depart with your families peaceable, which you may do undisturbed by any person, but in that time if you do not depart, we will use the means in our power to cause you to depart, for go you shall. You set up a nasty, dirty pedophagers office, pretending to be judges of the law, when it is a notorious fact that you are profoundly ignorant of it. You have been threatening continually to enter into a general system of prosecuting, determined, as you said, to pick a flaw in the titles of those who have bought city lots and built upon them. We have evidence of a very strong character that you are at this very time engaged with a gang of counterfeiters, coiners, and blacklegs. You have had the audacity to threaten us that if we offered to disturb you, you would get a mob up from Clay and Ray counties. For the insult, if nothing else, and you're threatening to shoot us if we offered to molest you, we he will put you from the county of Caldwell. Upon receiving this ultimatum, the two Whitmers, with Oliver Cowdery and Lyman Johnson, set out for Clay County to hire a Gentile lawyer. When they returned from Liberty, they met their families on the road, bearing a tale of Danite persecution that the men could not believe possible as coming from their former brethren. The Danites had surrounded their homes, ordered their wives to pack their blankets and leave the county immediately, and threatened death to anyone who returned to Far West. They had been robbed, according to John Whitmer, of all their goods save bedding and clothes. Missouri was teaching the Mormons much. This first act of violence was as much a release of their pent-up hatred against the whole state and intermittent robberies, floggings, and burnings as against the handful of dissenters. For five years, the saints had choked back their resentment and swallowed meekly all the insults and calumny heaped upon them. They were weary of wearing the mantle of martyrdom and eager to unsheathe their swords. But attacking these few scapegoats did not purge the venom that had been storing up ever since 1833. Macbeth-like, 
The Danites looked about for new enemies when ridding themselves of one group had merely augmented their suspicion and brought a deep sense of guilt. Shortly after the expulsion of the dissenters, the Prophet announced the revival in modified form of the old United Order. On July 8, 1838, he read to the saints in Far West several revelations calling upon them to deed all their property to the church and promising in return that every man would receive a tract of his land for his everlasting inheritance, the number of acres being determined by the size of his family. The surplus property was to remain in the hands of the bishop, to be used for the, the building of the temple, supporting the church presidency, and laying the foundation of Zion. Once the inheritances had been settled upon, every saint was expected to give one-tenth of his annual interest to the church. Rigdon followed the prophet's exposition with a heated warning that all those who failed to consecrate their property to the Lord would eventually lose it to Gentile marauders. Those who refused to comply were to be delivered over to the brothers of Gideon. With this threat ringing in their ears, and the fate of the dissenters a reminder that Rigdon's warnings could not be lightly dismissed, the saints voted unanimously to consecrate their property to the Lord. The new order was extremely unpopular. The majority, according to John D. Lee, felt like Ananias and Sapphira. They dared not trust all to God and his prophet. They felt that their church money was safe in their own possessions as it was when held by church authorities. And it quickly became clear that the saints had voted to please the priesthood, and then acted to suit themselves. When he saw the consecration plan was certain to fail, Joseph was quick to modify it. Instead of asking an outright transfer of title, he ordered the saints to lease their property to the church without consideration or interest from 10 to 99 years. The whole church was then to be divided into huge, four huge corporations, farmers, mechanics, shopkeepers, and laborers, which would utilize the land, machinery, and skills of the church members for the common good. Very little is known about the operation of these cooperatives, since the Mormons were expelled from Missouri even before the organization was complete. One convert, Brother Winchester, wrote to his relatives in the early fall with great enthusiasm. All kinds of necessary articles will soon be manufactured by these firms that we may be under no necessity of purchasing of our enemies. The firms furnish constant employ for all who join them and pay one dollar per day for a man's work. Any surplus that may remain after paying the demands of the firm is to be divided according to the needs and wants, not according to the property invested, to each family, annually or oftener if needed. The operations of these firms enables a man to get a comfortable house in very few days when he gets about it. First by working for the firm for 70 or 80 days, then the firm turn out stone cutters, teams, carpenters, masers, masons, to complete the house and nearly everything save the land is paid for by a man's own labor for a day. Apparently, the agricultural corporation was only one completely organized. This consisted of several cooperatives called the Big Field United Firms, each of which supervised the communal farming as a 7,000 acre tract. Overseers directed the allotment of work and management of horses and machinery. Arrangements will soon be made, Winchester wrote, that a person can get every necessary to eat, drink, live in, on, and to wear at the storehouse of the firms, and the best part of it all is that they want no better to pay than labor. Arrangements are making that no person shall have the excuse of not laboring, nothing to do, nor shall the idle eat the bread of industry. Reed Peck wrote in 1839 that many had been violently opposed to this new church order, but after much argument, preaching, and teaching and explaining by S. Avar, the excitement was allayed and all but a few contested to give up their property. But Peck's implication of that the saints joined the firms out of fear of the Danites is hardly plausible. Most converts were willing to join as long as they retained title to their land. They accepted the plan for what it was, a serious attempt to wipe out poverty, to make the most of every man's labor, and to establish the church as a self-sufficient economic island in a turbulent Gentile sea. On June 24, 1838, William Schwartzel made a troubled entry in his diary. I cannot listen with ease to the preaching of Lyman White, his exhorting a war upon the peaceful citizens of Missouri. In one of his sermons, he denounced them because they would not embrace Mormon faith as hypocrites, long-faced dupes, devils, infernal hobgoblins, and ghosts, and that they ought to be damned and sent to hell where they were properly belonged. No saint was ever quite so eager to spread Mormonism by the sword as Lyman White, but his fulminations reflected a sentiment that was growing stronger. The Danites, bored with drilling and maneuvers, were thirsting for action and listened to reports of fresh Gentile insults with their fingers on their guns. 
On the 4th of July, several thousand Mormons gathered in Far West for a great celebration. Joseph had chosen the day for laying the cornerstone of the temple, and he planned to make it an occasion of pomp and splendor. The parade he had organized seven years earlier to celebrate the laying of the temple cornerstone in Independence had been thin, ragged, and a little ludicrous. But of this parade he had made a spectacle that amazed and frightened the old settlers who had poured in to watch the ceremony. Every Mormon marched to the temple site, the infantry coming first, followed by the church leaders and civilians, and an impressive display of cavalry bringing up this rear. Here was the might of Zion for all to see. Rigdon began the oration of the day with an ominous text. Better, far better, to sleep with the dead than be oppressed among the living. Most of his speech was mild and patriotic, but when he reached the peroration, he broke into a frenzy that chilled the hearts of thoughtful Mormons and turned the Gentiles hot with rage. Our cheeks have been given to the smiters, and our heads to those who have plucked off the hair. We have not only, when smitten on one cheek, turned the other, but we have done it again and again, until we are wearied of being smitten and tired of being trampled upon. But from this day and hour we will suffer it no more. And that mob that comes on to us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. For we will follow them till the last drop of their blood is spilled, or else they will have to exterminate us for we will carry the seed of war to their own houses and their own families, and one party or the other shall be utterly destroyed. Remember it then, all men. We will never be the aggressors. We will infringe upon the rights of no people, but shall stand for our own until death. We this day then proclaim ourselves free with a purpose and determination that can never be broken. No, never. No, never. No, never. The crowd broke into wild cheering and then shouted in in unison with a thunder that carried over the prairies, Hosanna! Hosanna to God and the Lamb! The Gentiles, hands on their guns, slipped away silently. Joseph imprudently allowed the speech to be published in the Liberty Press and had copies distributed in pamphlet form. The Missouri newspapers replied with tirades of abuse. Three days after the speech, a violent electric storm swept across far west. The saints fled to their cabins in terror, for the Lord seemed bent on hurling his thunderbolts directly at the sacred city. One bolt shook the earth, and white-faced women eyed one another mutely, wondering which cabin they had been singled out for justice. When the storm passed, they walked down the rain-drenched roads and collected in a crowd on the square. There the liberty pole around which they had paraded with such pride on the 4th of July lay splintered on the ground. Uneasily they sensed an evil omen, and Lumen Shirtliff cried out, Farewell to our liberties in Missouri.